And I'm very happy to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Um, we have Dr. Sarah McCracken. Uh, she goes by Gussie and uh, she'll be talking to us about plant animal interactions in the fossil record. And Dr. McCracken mm -hmm. is with the Denver Museum of Nature and Sciences in the Department of Earth Sciences. And I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to get Gussie to pull up her okay. presentation. Thank you so much for being here, Gussie. And I, I'd like to remind everybody, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat and I'll be keeping track of them. And then we will uh, get to them at the end of the presentation. So thank you so much for being here tonight with us, Dr. McCracken. Oh, I'm, I'm very excited to give this talk. Thank you for inviting me. So I'll just begin by giving a brief introduction or another introduction um, to who I am. So my name is Gussie McCracken. Um, I am a paleontologist, so I study ancient life and ancient ecosystems. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in uh, fossil plants and insects and how they interacted um, in the past. And so um, I went to college just north of you guys and uh, Colorado. I went to Colorado College and then worked at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science afterwards. And there, I, you know, I fell in love with fossil plants because there's such a huge variety of them and you can go and dig up fossil plants all over the country. And in one day, you can find a hundred different species of fossil plants that no one has um, described before. So the possibilities are endless. And when you're looking at dinosaurs, uh, which are also very fun. Um, you know, you can spend an entire year digging up one single dinosaur. So, you know, the sample size of plants and then also their ecological associations with insects just lend itself to asking and answering great, great questions about uh, past ecology. So today I am going to focus on more of the insect side of what I do, looking at ancient plant insect associations. So I'm gonna start with just some background on what I do and how I do it, the questions that I'm asking and the uh, places that I go and dig up these fossil specimens from. And then I'm gonna look at uh, three different, essentially natural history stories about uh, insect herbivores and their associations with plants in the past. So the first will be a description of late Cretaceous scale insects. And then I'll be talking about uh, my newest paper that came out on a leaf mining moth from the late Cretaceous. And then the third story will be fossil mite plant associations um, and the possible age of these. How long ago have they, uh, did they evolve and how long have they been going on? And then I'll wrap everything up and uh, talk about future directions and take questions at the very end. All right, so insects are just so hyper diverse. They are the most diverse um, macroscopic organisms on earth. Um, they think that there are up to about 30 million different species of insects today on earth. Um, and this diversity is followed by the diversity of vascular plants, um, which I'm sure in Texas, you look around and, and you're all aware of just the thousands and thousands of different plants that you might see uh, when you go for, for walks around your community and around natural areas. And what's really interesting about both uh, plants and insects is that they've been interacting for over 400 million years. Um, the biggest interaction that we see today and in the past is insect herbivory. And um, insects on average each year consume uh, up to 18% of the global vegetation. And this has some really big impacts for us humans because we spend billions and billions of dollars fighting insect herbivory in our agro ecosystems, um, either spraying chemicals or finding more um, sort of organic and sustainable ways to ward off insect pests like planting cover crops or, or experimenting with different nettings. And then we also are 
you know, essentially seeing and sometimes battling insect herbivores in our own backyards. So a lot of people are spraying their lawns with chemicals or, um, you know, they go out and they find that their vegetables have all been punctured and are, are no longer edible. And so, you know, insect herbivory really touches us um, each day, whether we, we think about it or not in the food that we eat and, and in our uh, yards and in our gardens. Um, and what's really interesting about insect herbivory is that we can see it really easily in fossil leaves. And so here's an example of a leaf being chewed up by a caterpillar in a very similar shaped leaf with very similar damage that is actually 75.7 million years old. And you can really see all those nice little holes that have been chewed out of the leaf. And this is extremely important for what I do because insect fossils are pretty rare. They take a very specific set of environmental uh, conditions to preserve a fossil insect. So insects are kind of soft and squishy. They decay rapidly. They're eaten even when they're dead by other uh, creatures such as fish. Um, and they require the right preservational environment. Oftentimes this is a uh, lake environment or very, very slow moving kind of swampy environment. Um, where the insect falls into the water and gets buried very quickly before it has time to decay. Um, and another thing we need is very small grain, uh, grain size for the sediment. And so uh, more of like a clay grain size is best because when you get you know, a sandstone, insect fossils just kind of look like dark smudges. You can't really tell any of the nice details of them. And oftentimes we don't even know that that might be an insect we're seeing. And so um, insect damage on plants is extremely common. It's extremely useful because we don't find as many insects and plants are preserved in a greater number of uh, depositional environments and in a really great abundance. Um, so for example, I was on a dig in 2019 um, my last dig before the pandemic. And we spent about a week and a half digging fossil leaves and we collected thousands and thousands of samples. We actually had to get them helicoptered out of our field site in a big, um, essentially series of crates in a big net uh, because we had been able to collect so many different kinds of leaves. Um, so this is really a, a rich and abundant um, set of uh, data that we can draw from and understand what was going on in the past. And so what can insect damage on fossil leaves teach us about ancient ecosystems? Well, first we can look at the evolution of particular insects and their plant hosts. So we can maybe look at uh, 300 million year old um, uh, fossil plants, and we might be able to see that a specific type of insect damage has now evolved. For instance, when you get a, a piercing and sucking insect that has a mouth part sort of like a mosquito, um, but it actually punctures the leaf and sucks out uh, the, the phloem uh, or sometimes xylem. Um, and gets that, that nutrition from the leaf that way. And so we can look at different time periods and try to figure out when different insects, uh, general groups of insects might have evolved. Um, or sometimes we can even identify the damage that insects make to a particular genus or family of insects. And then we can track um, whether these herbivores and plants are uh, together through time or whether um, maybe the plant develops more defenses and is herbivorized less over time. So it's it's really kind of a cool way to, to think about the evolution of plants and insects. We can also look at climate change. So um, insects and plants are really sensitive to uh, climate change. For instance, when you get um, a buildup of greenhouse gases like we've had in the past and like we're doing right now, um, you end up changing the, the chemistry essentially of, of plants. So when you have higher uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 
you change the carbon dioxide to nitrogen levels in the leaves themselves. And nitrogen is something that insects really need um, in order to survive. So they end up eating more plant material to get the same amount of nitrogen. And so over periods of extreme climate change in the past, we can actually track insect herbivory and see that insects are indeed eating more of the forest in those times when temperatures are higher and when carbon dioxide is higher in the atmosphere. We can also look at extinction and recovery events. For instance, right now in my postdoctoral fellowship um, through the National Science Foundation, I'm starting to look at the um, Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event that killed the dinosaurs. And I'm looking at the plants and the insect herbivores that survived the extinction event. And then we're tracking the pace of recovery for all of these different um, plant and insect associations. And what I've been focusing on um, more recently in the past was the evolution of modern ecosystems. Why do we see the diversity of plants and insects that we see today? Can we track this? Can we look into deep time and make connections to today's insects and today's plants? Um, and so today on earth, um, we are dominated by flowering plants, um, which all are also known as angiosperms, as I'm sure a lot of you are well aware of. Um, and so over, I think it's 95% or so of all um, plant species on earth today are angiosperms. And the rest are divided up between the gymnosperms, those are things like conifers, ginkgos, cycads, and nematophytes, the ferns and their allies, um, including lycopods and horsetails, and finally the, the mosses, the hornworts, and the liverworts. But the interesting thing about uh, this angiosperm dominated earth that we see today is that it wasn't always this way. So here we see a graph where we have uh, age and millions of years on the x-axis, and it's actually not number of species, it's, it's percentage of species on the y-axis. And what we're seeing is that um, around the early Cretaceous, before flowering plants had evolved, they evolved around 135 million years ago or so. So before flowering plants evolve, we have a lot of ferns, we have cycads, we have conifers. And then once angiosperms evolve, they radiate really rapidly. They become many different species very, very quickly and it's unprecedented in Earth's history. And so um, I like to study the, the, the Cretaceous, especially the late Cretaceous, in order to see maybe how and why um, angiosperms uh, just sort of took over the earth in such a small amount of time. And so a lot of my work has been centered in the Kuiperowitz Formation. It's in the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Um, and it's this really uh, beautiful area of the country. Uh, and our country about 75 million years ago looked something like this. So temperatures were higher globally and sea levels were much higher. And in fact, they were so high that the middle of North America was flooded by the Western Interior Seaway. And so in San Antonio, I think you guys would be underwater 75 million years ago. Um, and the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, the Caperos Formation um, was right in this nice um, sort of depositional plain similar to say the bayous of Louisiana today, where you get these mountains that are um, eroding and all this sediment is coming down um, and, and preserving a wealth of different kinds of organisms, including fossil plants. So this is a map of the Kaiperowitz formation today. Um, you can see it in green. Um, and these are the sort of new and uh, older borders of the monument. And I'm hoping it gets um, expanded again to its original borders, because as you can see, some of the, the Kuiperowitz uh, lies outside of the park as of now. 
And this is what it looks like today. It's an extensive series of badlands, really, really rugged terrain, really beautiful and amazing plants growing there. But this is what it looked like in the past about 75 million years ago. Um, and what's interesting about the Kaperowitz is that along these river channels or swamps, um, what we see are all of these flowering plants um, because they are at this time very diverse. They've already taken over these um, areas with high disturbance because flowering plants can actually grow more quickly and they end up pushing out things that grow slower like conifers. And so we see mostly angiosperms in the Kuiperowitz formation um, deposits compared to older fossil deposits of plants uh, that would have been more conifer, cycad, fern based. And so this is sort of the period of time that we're seeing um, with the Kuiperowitz formation deposit. And you can see that um, it really preserves this nice slice of time where uh, angiosperms have already radiated. Um, and now you're seeing ecosystems that are that are kind of newly um, dominated by angiosperms. So in general, my research objectives were to first document the diversity of insect damage on fossil leaves from the late Cretaceous about 75 million years ago in the Kaiperowitz formation flora, and then describe new plant host species, novel insect damage types, and important plant insect associations. And so while I'm uh, describing new species of plants, um, including some uh, Lauraceae and some Araceae and even some uh, gingers, and gibberaceae, um, I think it's really the, uh, the insect stories that are kind of um, the most fun. They tell such interesting stories. So um, when I'm collecting insect damage data, um, I start by categorizing the, the pattern of insect damage. And I do this by um, first grouping it into a feeding guild. So things like whole feeding versus um, skeletonization and leaf mining, which I'll get into in just a minute. And then each pattern actually has its own number associated with it. Um, so uh, here we can actually see some whole feeding damage types on the top row, um, and you can see their different sizes, their different patterns. Um, sometimes it's, you know, the number of them that are associated together. Um, sometimes it's just the shape or the extent of the damage. And once we have the um, damage type, then we can calculate things like how rich are all of, or how diverse are all of the insect herbivores in a locality, how um, much of a flora has been consumed by insect herbivores. And so I'm just gonna really quick run you through the major feeding guilds that I um, explore in my research. And the first is whole feeding. It's kind of um, self-evident. An insect chews a hole through a leaf. Um, and here you can see a bunch of different examples of the sizes and the patterns of whole feeding. Um, and whole feeding is done by insects with what we call mandibulate mouth parts, chewing mouth parts. Um, like this nice uh, caterpillar eating away on this beautiful leaf. Next, we have margin feeding, um, also done by mandibulate insects. Um, and this is where the insect chews along the edge of the leaf. And this is, in fact, um, the oldest uh, insect herbivory that we find in the fossil record. And it dates back um, over 400 million years. Um, we have skeletonization, and this is when an insect has chewed holes in the leaf but has left the veins intact. And this is often because uh, veins are tough. You might not be able to chew through them if you're an insect. They also can carry a lot of um, chemical defenses of the plant. And so sometimes you don't wanna break the vein and potentially get squirted with latex or something like that. Um, we have surface feeding. This is when an insect chews 
one surface of the leaf and leaves the other intact. Um, this is uh, sometimes fun to find in the fossil record because when you are digging up fossil leaves, um, what you do is essentially uh, pull out a block of rocks and then there are layers in those rocks. You take a hammer and you crack along the layers. If there's a fossil leaf, it's actually a weakness in the rock. Sometimes it'll split open like a nice book. So here you're seeing what we call the part and counterpart uh, fossil leaf. And we can see that only one side of the leaf was herbivorized and the other was left intact. Insects might choose, to, uh, insects might do this because they um, don't want predators like, uh, for instance, birds um, to see that there's a uh, holding chewed in the leaf. They might be on the underneath side of the leaf and kind of stealthily, stealthily eating it. Next, we have piercing and sucking. And I had uh, previously described this a little bit. Um, this is made by insects with mosquito-like mouth parts, um, similar to uh, aphids, where they just um, stick their mouth into the, the plant and suck out the juices, essentially. Um, we find fossil galls, and these are really interesting. It's when an insect lays an egg inside of the, um, the leaf, and the insect hatches into the larva and actually produces uh, hormones that mimic plant growth hormones for the leaf. And so the, the plant actually ends up building sort of a, a house structure for the insect that li to live in and, and to um, feed in. Uh, so this is sort of a, a parasitism. Um, and then we have my favorite type of insect herbivory, uh, leaf mining. And this is similar to galling in which the the adult lays an egg inside of the leaf tissue. When the egg hatches, that larva actually eats its way through the center of the leaf. Um, and they do it in such constrained patterns that we can oftentimes identify the type of leaf miner um, down to maybe uh, family, insect family, um, sometimes even to the genus level, which is really exciting. So you can look at the damage types of leaf miners and say, oh, I know that this is a moth, I know that this is a beetle, I know that this is a sawfly, for instance. We have oviposition, which is not uh, herbivory per se, um, but it is damage to the photosynthetic surface of the leaf. So here you can see a leaf just covered in insect eggs and this other little leaf on the right hand side um, with the three oviposition marks as actually a floating aquatic leaf um, where we think we have dragonfly um, egg laying. And then finally we actually see seed predation in the fossil record. Um, and this can be little drill holes in fossil seeds. Um, and so this, we also have to, uh, herbivory, we have to sort of identify based on the patterns of, of the um, herbivory uh, that we know of today. For instance, insects will make certain patterns and we can see those in the past. Um, we try to uh, separate herbivory from like a fungal infection um, or decay that we see in the fossil leaf. So it's not a, a perfect science, but we have such um, kind of extraordinary uh, sample sizes that hopefully it comes out in the wash at the end. So not all damage is caused by insects. Some is fungal, some is tearing. Um, as you can see here on the right, uh, that's a torn leaf, maybe because of high winds. On the left, that's a toddler, probably not around in the fossil record, but I thought it was very cute uh, that this child punched holes in someone's house plant. Um, so things that we look for to determine insect damage includes uh, reaction rims around the site of damage. And so here around the holes, you can actually see there's a thickened, darkened tissue. And that is the plant while it's alive, um, building up a defense essentially against being herbivorized. Um, so we look for, for that in the fossil record. And one of the things that we have to keep in mind about insect damage is that one individual insect is capable sometimes of making multiple different kinds of damage. 
And uh, alternatively, one type of damage might be, might be made by different kinds of insects. So this is not a one-to-one -one, uh, measure of herbivore diversity in the fossil record, but it does give us a general idea of the types of insect herbivores that were in the past and um, the maybe diversity of insect herbivores. There are some damage types where we can really identify exactly what made them. So here's an example of Eocene age or about 45 million year old um, leaf cutter bee damage uh, from Germany. And we know that leaf cutters make these very uh, pronounced damage types and we can find them all over the place in the fossil record. And it's really quite interesting to see um, that leaf cutter bees or at least their relatives go back, you know, tens of millions of years um, throughout the Cenozoic. We also have uh, some leaf mines that we know exactly what made them. Here we have um, a phytomyzid uh, fly that makes leaf mines, and we can actually find these leaf mines in the fossil record. And what's interesting is we're able to determine that um, this leaf miner actually switched plant hosts through time, possibly in um, relation to uh, a changing climate and a changing availability of the plants um, over millions of years. So now I'm gonna go into some of my most recent discoveries, um, just sort of natural history uh, tales that I think are, are kind of fun. And I'm gonna start with one that is very much in progress, but I wanted to show you uh, these late Cretaceous um, scale insects uh, because they're, they're really rare in the fossil record and, and they're really interesting because we can actually see their, their bodies and see what they were eating. So scale insects are hemipterans. These are true bugs and they're in the suborder Sternorhynchia and in the superfamily Cacoidea. And um, as you can see, here's an example of all the different, some of the different groups of hemipterans and the scale insects, which are at the very bottom right, um, look wildly different from their hemipteran counterparts. So here we see a variety of different scale insects. These are all female scale insects. And you might um, think of these when you see them on your plants in your garden as maybe a, a fungus, a scale fungus, but they're actually insects. Um, they're alive and uh, sometimes they're not that harmful to your plants. Sometimes they are, um, they can be really difficult to get rid of. Um, but what I think is very cool is that we've actually, or sorry, here, um, here it shows you what they're doing to the fossil, or sorry, to the plant. They um, inject their long mouth parts. Uh, they're related to things like aphids with those long stylet mouth parts, and they inject them into the um, the plant and suck up the the nice juices, all the sugar, and um, they're sessile, so they are basically stuck to where um, where they live. They don't really move much. Uh, most of them don't. And um, down in Texas, you might be familiar with some um, scale insects in particular, the cochineal scale insects um, that you might see on um, prickly pears. And these have actually been harvested for hundreds, if not thousands of years um, in order to make red dyes. Uh, and they make excellent red dyes. They, you grind up the bodies um, to make the dye concoction and they actually are, are such good dyes that they stay red much longer than a lot of the, um, the modern, you know, uh, dyes produced in factories today. So if you see a really old textile with, with brilliant red dye still, it was probably from cochineal scale bugs. And something that's really cool about scale insects is that the females look like the scales. They're the sessile um, insects, but the males are actually uh, much smaller usually and they have flight. 
Um, and so here in the top uh, left-hand corner, you can actually see um, an ant. And then next to the ant is a male um, scale insect. And then in relation to the size of that little male scale insect is uh, the female that they're both standing on. And so the life cycle of scale insects looks something like this, um, where the, the, the first star, first in stars, uh, the, the young baby scale insects look pretty similar and they're both, you know, uh, they can both walk around, they have legs. Um, and then the males eventually develop into flying adults and the females um, kind of settle down and, and stay put. Um, and just tap into that into that nice uh, plant for food. And so what I'm trying to do with the scale insects that uh, we found from the late Cretaceous about 75 million years ago is sort of plot them onto the tree of life. And so what we know based on um, molecular phylogenies of scale insects today is that uh, we think they evolved somewhere in the Triassic, maybe around 245 million years old. So these are pretty ancient insects. They evolved before angiosperms, the flowering plants, evolved in the Cretaceous. And so they were originally feeding on things like conifers and cycads and ferns. And then at some point, they switch plant hosts and maybe become different species over time. Um, and now they're found on a huge range of flowering plants. And so what I want to do is take our Cretaceous scale insects and try to figure out um, what plants they might be on and also what sort of group that they're in within the scale insects. And we can do this by looking at the segmentation of these insects. Um, and I'm also in the process of CT scanning them and maybe looking under a fluorescence microscope to try to pick out any little details that I can in order to identify them. And then once I do that, I'll be able to hopefully plot them on the scale insect tree of life. And then we might be able to use the fossil as a minimum age for a specific group of scale insects. Fossils are really wonderful at sort of uh, helping root these molecular um, phylogenies because we know when we find a fossil of a certain age, then that group of organisms is at a minimum that age and likely older. So it's, uh, it's definitely a work in progress, but I wanted to show you guys sort of science in the middle of science. Now, the next um, study that I did actually just came out in the Journal of Systematic Paleontology, and we're describing a new leaf mine, Leucopteropsa spirale, um, again from the Kuiperowitz formation of the late Cretaceous. Um, and it's really the earliest evidence of a pretty common agricultural pest. So I was looking at my 5,000th uh, fossil leaf one day in Denver a few years ago, and I happened upon this leaf mine and it looked like nothing I'd ever seen in my life. And so I did what, you know, a lot of scientists in my field do and I Googled it. And I just tried to describe the, the leaf mine in Google image. And you know what? I actually found a mine that looks almost identical. Um, and I realized that this mine came from a species of uh, moth called Leucoptera malifoliella. Um, and it actually has a fairly global distribution. Um, the genus definitely has a global distribution and it feeds on uh, a lot of rosaceae, um, a lot of orchard rosaceae. So, you know, apples and, and pears and um, it, it has maybe the genus feeds on a hundred different species of of um, flowering plants. So it's, it's really this remarkable uh, leaf miner. And so because our leaf mine looks very similar to the Leucoptera leaf mines, uh, we named our ichno genus or our trace fossil genus uh, Leucopteropsa, which means Leucoptera-like. Um, and then the species Spirale, 
uh, just meaning that it spirals. And so one thing that you can see, let's see. Okay, one thing that you can sort of see in this um, dot image that I, that I drew um, is that what happens in that leaf vine is the egg was laid in the center and then the, the insect was eating its way in a circular pattern that kind of spirals outwards, um, which is pretty remarkable uh, and pretty rare um, as far as leaf vines go. So we're, we're fairly sure that it's uh, that it belongs to this genus, or at least is the predecessor of current Leucoptera. And so what we found with this um, discovery was that it's the earliest record of the group that Leucopter is in, the semiostomine leaf mining moths. Um, it provides a reliable fossil calibration point uh, for the age of these moths. So again, it kind of pinpoints a minimum age for these moths, and it actually pushed what we thought the minimum age was back a few million years. And it's an indicator for the antiquity of the most diverse group of, of um, lepidopterans or, or the big group of, um, of moths and butterflies, which is the Dytrisia. All right, and then my final kind of natural history story that I'm gonna talk about is probably my favorite one. Um, it's late Cretaceous Acheridomatia and the antiquity of plant mite mutualisms. And it's really my favorite because, um, you know, it takes something that's really quite tiny and unassuming, and we're able to sort of rewrite the record of uh, plant mite mutualisms in the fossil record. So again, I'm looking at my gazillion fossil leaf um, under a microscope. I'm looking for things like holes, um, leaf mines, all that kind of lovely damage. And I come across these two holes in the vein axles. So they're actually holes in the veins. And it kind of struck me as odd and I made a note of it in my data set and I moved on. And I was thinking about it like in bed that night. And I was like, that is so weird because insects don't usually like to uh, consume the veins. Um, you know, and they're really not going to target the veins because they're just not as nutritious. They're a lot harder. And why would you chew holes in the veins? And I realized that it wasn't an antagonistic association, um, which herbivory is antagonistic. It was a mutualism. So mutualisms are cooperative associations among species, and there are two main plant animal mutualisms. The first is insect pollination. So when you see bees and butterflies pollinating your garden. Um, the second is seed dispersal. Um, and this can be done by things all the way from the size of ants to birds to mastodons. Um, and so those are kind of the big two for plant animal mutualisms. But what people don't realize is that the third most common is actually a charodomatia. So let's break down the word. Uh, what are domatia? Domatia um, means domicile or house. They are structures produced by the plants to house arthropods. And if you've ever heard of domatia, you might be familiar with um, Myrmeca domatia. These are uh, domatia for ants specifically. So like you might know the acacia trees in Africa, sometimes they have these beautiful swollen thorns that the ants live inside, and they actually um, defend that tree from big and small herbivores uh, because they're really vicious little insects. Um, and in return for defending the tree, uh, they get this you know, wonderful safe home. But even more common than those ant domatia are mite domatia. So a caro stands for mite. Um, mites uh, are in the order a carry. Um, and uh, they are structures specifically in the axles of veins, uh, the kind of convergence of um, leaf veins um, where the mites are housed. And again, it's the third most common plant animal mutualism, but it's so tiny that most people don't really 
uh, think about it, they don't know about it, they don't look for it. And it can manifest in several different types. You can have pouches, you can have pockets, you can have clusters of hairs. Um, it's really anything that the plant can produce um, that mites can live inside of. So there are a few things you need to know about, um, about this system, this plant mite mutualism to then understand the ecological and evolutionary uh, significance of it. Um, so first, let's think about the plant hosts. Um, uh, uh, Caridomatia are actually only found on flowering plants. Remember, they evolved in the Cretaceous and now they are kind of dominant on the earth today. Um, and Caridomatia are mostly found on woody dicots. And so these are, um, trees and uh, big shrubs, sometimes even uh, lianas, which are woody vines. Um, today, they're known from about 80 families of plants and over 2,000 species. Although, again, the uh, small size of Acaridomatia um, likely means that we're grossly underestimating all the types of plants that have this mutualism uh, because no one has uh, taken a close enough look. And they're extremely common in some forests, up to 70% of individual plants can have a keratomatia. Now let's think about the, the mite partners. So the mites that live in a keratomatia are either predators that are eating other mites, other uh, herbivorous mites, um, or they're fungivores. So they're eating um, a fungus that would hurt the plant. There are about 27 mite families that are known to inhabit uh, Domatia, although again, this is probably an underestimate. Um, the Domatia provide protection from predators and from drying out, especially when they are very young or um, even as eggs. And this is not a facultative mutualism. That means that the mites can live without the a keratomatia. The plants can live without the mites, but when it happens, it's golden. It's wonderful for both. So this um, mutualism develops a tritrophic association, a three-level association um, in the ecosystem. So just to reiterate, uh, the plant uh, develops the keratomatia on its own. It's not controlled by the mite, it's controlled by the plant. In return, the mite then protects the plant by either eating the fungus that would in turn hurt the plant or eating the herbivorous mites. And so our fossil Acaridomatia, we found them in two different localities in the Kuiperowitz. We had a total of 13 examples on 10 different leaves. Um, they were between about, they were around a millimeter in diameter. Um, and they were only found on one species of fossil leaf, which we can't name because we have no idea what it is, um, which is sadly the case with a lot of Cretaceous leaves. Um, you know, when you're thinking about keying out modern plants, for instance, and you're looking at all these different characters uh, to understand, you know, what, what family, what genus, what species that plant is, um, Think about if you only had the single leaf, you would be really limited. And so um, oftentimes we can't necessarily identify fossil plants in the same way that you identify modern plants. And also these late Cretaceous plants are so old that they might, you know, they might not have anything uh, that's similar to them today. We might not be able to, um, you know, understand this, this lineage of plants because it has since then gone extinct and we don't know, um, you know what it's most closely related to. So anyway, back to Um This is the plant that we find Acaridomatia on. It's, it's actually quite large. Um, the scale bar you see is about five centimeters. Uh, and the, the illustration is our best guess at what the Acaridomatia would have looked like um, when the plants were alive and when the mites were living inside of them. 
And so the, the interesting thing about this discovery um, is that we can kind of pinpoint when we think these mutualisms might have evolved. And so uh, we kind of have to think about the, the history of fossil plants. So we have the first fossil angiosperms appearing around 135, 140 million years ago, but we don't see woody angiosperms really radiating really uh, big on the landscape until about 100 million years ago. The second earliest Echerodomatia were about 45 million years old. Ours pushed back the um, timeline 25 million years into the late Cretaceous. Again, ours are about 75 million years old. And so what this timeline um, helps us do is predict when a Charidomatia might have evolved. So we think that they evolved at least by around 100 million years ago, because remember, we find them mostly on uh, woody angiosperms today, but they could have been uh, you know, fairly older than that. They could have been 120, 130 maybe even. Um, million years old. Um, but it's really interesting that you can kind of start to contain uh, where we think that this mutualism might have evolved. And I, I thought this, you know, very little, very unassuming um, feature on the fossil leaf was, was actually quite exciting because when we think about the radiation of angiosperms, a lot of paleontologists um, understand that the relationships between insect pollinators really uh, helped angiosperms become as dominant on the landscape as they are today, helped them uh, radiate and speciate in the Cretaceous. And the same thing with, um, with uh, seed dispersal um, by, by insects and by other animals. And so I am throwing my hat into the ring and saying, well, we think that Echerodomatia, this kind of widespread, very common mutualism, probably evolved by at least 100 million years ago, potentially earlier, and contributed to the rise in radiation of angiosperms, and is therefore really important in the history of flowering plants, and also part of the reason why we maybe see uh, a world dominated by flowering plants today. So just to wrap it up for the Echerodomatia, we have the oldest known Echerodomatia in the fossil record. We push back the timeline about 25 million years. Um, this was likely within about 25 million years of the earliest evolution of the Echerodomatia and possibly linked to the success of flowering plants in the Cretaceous. And really it just kind of further um, shows that even things that are kind of buried in museum collections that haven't been pulled out of drawers in years, um, kind of the unassuming and the overlooked can rewrite our, our history, our, our understanding of ancient ecosystems and evolution. So in conclusion, um, insect herbivory uh, from the late Cretaceous Kuiperowitz formation is both diverse and abundant. Um, we see some kind of interesting natural history stories about uh, early scale insects, um, which might be able to tell us about the evolution of that lineage uh, in the fossil record. Um, we also looked at the first occurrence of a Leucoptera leaf mine um, and thought more about um, sort of the evolution of moths in general and, and leaf mining moths. And then um, I touched on the evolution of plant mite mutualisms and potentially the age of those and the importance of plant mite mutualisms. And so um, one of the things I want to leave you with before I talk about future directions is to go look in your gardens, look in, you know, at, at leaves on your walks. Once you start seeing insect damage, once you start finding a keratomatia, you're actually gonna find them everywhere. You know, if you have, um, uh, especially oaks um, around you, you can look at the leaves and they'll have tufts of hair in the veins. And those are a keratomatia, those are 
important mutualisms that I'm I'm positive no one else in your neighborhood is going to even ever think about once. Um, but you know, these little stories, these little damage types can actually tell these wonderful evolutionary histories. So what I'm doing right now in my postdoctoral fellowship is looking at the um, mass extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs. And so one of the cool things that we're seeing is um, we're finding all of this uh, plant life and insect damage in the Cretaceous. And then we have the extinction event. And then we see many, many fewer types of plants for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and we see very, very generalized insect damage because if you specialize on only one type of food and that food goes extinct, you also probably will go extinct. And so we're learning about the pace of recovery, how ecosystems recover after really traumatic uh, kind of global changes. And um, if you wanna check out some of our initial work on the plants and the animals of these recoveries, we, we published a paper in Science um, in 2019, that's uh, pretty, pretty wild. And one of the things that I'm super excited to do is look at the earliest insect damage on legumes, um, Fabaceae, the, the bean family, um, which really uh, are, um, we now know that they might go into the Cretaceous, um, but these are some of the earliest examples of beans in the, in the fossil record. And now, you know, we use them globally as food sources and they're really, really common. Um, from the deserts to the tropics. So with that, I would like to thank all of my many collaborators, institutions that helped me along the ways, and fellowships and funding sources. <laughs>